Um, I am Andrea Ketchmark, Executive Director of the North Country Trail Association, and welcome to our evening of uh, North Country Stories. Um, tonight we're bringing to you Creating Space. It is our first in a series of conversations with outdoor leaders across the North Country Trail um, and even the National Trails community. Um, we hope that this series brings you kind of a more personal side of the work that we do, but also the work that so many other people are doing in this space, um, in trails, in outdoor recreation, and in public lands advocacy. So I am so excited for so many reasons tonight. Um, first, that we are um, celebrating this month our annual celebration. And as most of you know, we would normally be together in person um, in Pennsylvania or somewhere along the trail. This year it was going to be in Pennsylvania to celebrate the um, North Country Trail and the association and all of the great work that we do. This year, because of COVID, we were forced to do this online. Um, and because of that, I think we have brought to you a great series of online events, including celebrating our volunteers and different workshops um, and some really interesting speakers like we have tonight. So I'm so excited um, to start off this series of conversations. We'll have many more in the future, but to start the conversation with the exciting guest um, that we have tonight. Um, Alice has a, um, an incredible um, resume of work in the environmental background, um, environmental justice and economic development, um, but really is a leader in diversity and inclusion in outdoor spaces. Um, she's the host of Color Out Here, which is um, part of the Shaping Narratives um, series on WGVU, which is part of our local PBS station. So welcome, Alice. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, we are so excited um, to talk to you. And, and before we jump into, you know, I have a lot of questions and I know we really want this to be a, a conversation back and forth. I wanted to let everybody know that you can, you know, we will leave time at the end for questions and answers. And I think there is a Q&A um, little button at the bottom of your screen. So make sure you are um, inserting your questions there. We do have both Val and Abby, which a lot of you know, um, um, as part of this session that will be helping monitor those questions and making sure we get those to Alice at the end. Um, we have a great group tonight. We have people watching from all of our eight North Country Trail states but also from Iowa and Illinois. So welcome you guys. Um, we're really excited to have you here. And I think, you know, before we jump into the big conversation, I'm gonna start with um, showing a clip of Alice's show, um, Color Out Here, because we're gonna talk a lot about the show and talk a lot about, you know, what it means and, and the work that Alice is doing um, in the community, but you need to know what that show is. So um, let me share my screen and I'll give you a good clip. Ah, nature. It's where the smallest things can broaden my perspective, where I can just be. But not all people of color have the same relationship with the outdoors. For many black and brown people, the outdoors is historically complex in these United States. So I'm making this show to bring other people of color outside and to experience familiar places from a new perspective. My name is Alice Lynn, and today we are filming the pilot for my show, Color Out Here. West Coast for an outdoor adventure, and I've invited some awesome leaders of color, and only one has experience outdoors. All right, she's pretty much an expert. Shay Mohan specializes in leading outdoor expeditions, specifically for people of color to build community in nature and redefine their relationship with the outdoors. 
I also invited David. He's never canoed or camped, but he leads a research department at Grand Valley State University, and he's an expert in how spaces influence identity. We've also got Daryl Ross. We're waiting on Daryl still. Daryl is coming through with the large Sprinter van, and we're really excited about it. What are you calling that, a Sprinter van? Is that your name? That's a, it's a house on wheels. That's like a studio apartment. This is Daryl. He runs a business incubator and is a successful entrepreneur. I would argue that he's the least outdoorsy of us, but yet he's agreed to try some new experiences on camera. First up, we're driving from Grand Rapids to the Manistee River, 190 miles of clean, cool water and one of the best recreational waterways in the Midwest. It's a little over an hour drive, so it's the perfect amount of time for some good conversation. Well, this is kind of out of your comfort zone there, right? Because based on the reaction, people assume you wouldn't want to do stuff like this. Is that fair to say? Yeah, and I'm a germaphobe, and I'm a city person. <laughs> <laughs> There's no germs outside. What do you mean? I'm curious then, so like, if it's out of your comfort zone, why now? Why this thing? Why go? Oh, I mean, because it's still fun. I mean, I, I still think it's fun. I think things out of my comfort zone is fun. Okay. They try to test your boundaries a little bit. And relational wise. Gotcha. You know, Alice asked me to come. So. <laughs> okay. So for out of friendship and everything. Uh. Yeah, yeah. The Manistee River means different things to different people, which is why I'm excited to meet up with my friend Kareem Lewis. She's a member of the Little River Band of Ottawa Indians, the original people of this region. <laughs> area right here by the uh, Manistee River is um, in the Manistee National Forest and this whole area from Lake Michigan and then back towards the east about 20 miles is uh, Little River Band of Ottawa Indians reservation boundary. You know historically like this this whole state was Odawa territory. I've only been canoeing on this once and I have a story about that, but um, we should probably get on the water. Before we get on the water, a word about Kareen's community. Little River Band are an Adawa band, which means people of the heart. Adawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi together make up the Anishinaabe people of Michigan. The ancestors of Little River Band settled along the Thornapple River, the Grand River, White River, Pere Marquette River, and the Big and Little Manistee Rivers. Speaking of rivers, Shay is ready to help us learn how to canoe on this one. Pull it back and out. Okay. So it's really easy once you get in and be like, it's in there, I'm, I'm doing a thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it kind of takes some intention, right? And you can feel the resistance and you'll see these little like swirly dudes come off both edges. That's when you're like, Okay. Yeah, and if you don't pull the, the oar back out, like straight, like up, yes. you're going to be pushing back the opposite direction. Oh, yeah. and it's, oh it's, so straight it's down. Yeah. 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 We don't need anything more exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So I will let everybody watch that um, show on their own. We're definitely going to post. Um, when we post the recording of, of this video, we're going to, you know, post a link to color out here. But, you know, Alice, tell us a little bit about how the show really came about and, you know, where the idea came from and how you chose the people you did to join you. Yeah, um, thanks so much. Uh, so I guess uh, it started with a program called Shaping Narratives, which was um, put together through uh, WGU, which is our West Michigan sort of regional partner to PBS and NPR. Um, there, the intention of the program was to kind of pull together a group of um, community leaders of color to take them through kind of long training process in um, how we as people of color can effectively share our narratives um, in, in the media. So we went through a 10 week training as a cohort learning about decolonizing narrative and kind of what it means to look, um, kind of change the perspective that we're looking at our own racial identities through and the ways that we've kind of all learned how to um, see race in media um, historically and how can we change that. 
Uh, then we went through another 10 week co cohort on um, kind of media training. So on camera, off camera, um, kind of the technical skills there. And then uh, the third module uh, or 10 week piece was around community organizing and how can we effectively um, kind of engage people and start to kind of grow change around um, the premise that we each selected for our respective media projects. So mine was based on um, outdoor recreation and just having spent a lot of time in environmental advocacy and social justice advocacy and finding that there was often separation between um, people are oft, often separate environmentalism and um, social justice and kind of trying to understand my own journey and why I care about environmentalism and protecting natural resources, um, which I found a lot of that had to do with having a positive relationship to the outdoors. So that kind of led me on a journey of um, unpacking that and then working to learn from other people um, about their experience and you know, their own concerns or excitement about um, people of color and, and how they connect to uh, outdoor spaces and, and what that relationship looks like for them. Yeah. So what is, you know, we all, everybody that loves the outdoors has a, a story or a time that they remember really connecting with the outdoors for the first time. You know, what's your um, experience when you're like, that's when it, when you really got it, or was it just a, you know, early childhood, um, lifetime of, uh, you know, knowing that that was important to you? Um, I think it was kind of early on. Uh, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. Um, and originally, because my mother is originally uh, from Michigan, that was what prompted me to move here. But uh, I, my dad, uh, my dad is a multiracial black and my father's black man. And he took me out to use a compass in Prospect Park in Brooklyn and you know, we would go for like little hikes and there's pictures of like canteens full of apple juice kind of strapped on as we would go around Prospect Park. Um, and when I looked at, when I was looking at colleges, I decided to go for just a minor, um, minor change and, and end up going to, I ended up going to college in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan uh, at Northern Michigan University, which was a slight culture shock, but um, for the most part, I, I really enjoyed my experience up there, but that was the first place where I felt, um, I think I'd always kind of internalized a sense that I wasn't, you know, I didn't belong outdoors. Um, and, but it, it was in uh, the Upper Peninsula where I started to feel like I, I, I don't know, I, I had to be the guest of white people to go outside to learn about being in the outdoors. Um, and feeling like it, it just wasn't for me and kind of awkwardly in between the desire and curiosity um, and also the kind of intimidation and um, just, yeah, feeling kind of unwelcome or um, like that I didn't belong in those spaces. So I think that sort of created, that kind of drove some of that um, internal uh, struggle forward a little bit and kind of brought it to light. And, but it, it really is what I loved living in the UP. It was a great experience compared to living in Brooklyn, New York, um, and just seeing a very different side of our country and of nature. And I think that that, um, despite feeling excluded at times up there, it also helped to really kind of help me to nurture my relationship to outdoors. Yeah, that what a big change from. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was a little scary at first, but it was. Uh, it was <laughs> But I love the canteens of apple juice in Prospect Park. <laughs> yeah, yeah, had to go for the for the whole look. So yeah. Mm -hmm. So you know, talk a little bit about you know you talked about um, you know how how you felt being transplanted into that um, you know to that very different it's different physical environment but also very different cultural environment and you know I've I've heard you speak about and I've you know read articles about um, barriers that a lot of people feel, and especially people of color, um, to the outdoors. And what are those things that, um, you know, we may think it's a very welcoming place um, to everybody and, you know, both the locations and, and being outdoors and the organizations, but what are those very real, um, you know, barriers that keep people from feeling welcome or keep people from getting involved? Yeah. Um... 
I think, so there's a number of barriers that, you know, all could spend hours talking about each of them, so I will try to not do that. Um, but I, I think uh, the first one I would start with is um, kind of looking at the history of uh, American conservationist uh, work and, you know, John Muir and, and other folks who are kind of seen uh, in predominant environmentalist spaces as kind of the leaders or founders of environmentalism for our country, but um, we're very aligned with uh, eugenics and you know there's so many quotes within John Muir's writing about you know his racism towards um, black people towards indigenous people and I think that 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 was one of the the pieces that um, perpetuated that kind of disenfranchisement for people of color to be involved in any sort of outdoor stewardship once conservation in sort of this uh, I guess kind of white space started to come about. I mean, to be clear that, you know, indigenous people, of course, were stewarding this land for much longer <laughs> than that. But um, I think there's, you know, other historical pieces like, you know, just the, the Jim Crow, uh, Jim Crow era and Jim Crow laws and, and folks, um, there's a, a real fear that people experience for black people um, thinking that, you know, if you go out into the woods, you might not come back. And that is, that that still exists, that fear um, transgenerational trauma essentially is kind of passed down and even if you can't pinpoint where you've heard it I certainly heard it especially in the city that you know if you're kind of in the country that was not really a safe place to be as a person of color um, there's also you know you have a history of uh, having bounties on um, Native Americans and people essentially murdering the murder of indigenous people um, on their lands. So there's, there's a lot of um, historical context that sort of is passed down and has our kind of how we see outdoor recreation today was kind of built on that foundation. So it's important to kind of dig some of that, that up and, and, and address it. Um, and then I think there's also barriers just as far as resources go. Um, it can cost a lot of money to be outdoorsy. I didn't really, I had never thought of, you know, like sandals, uh, like uh, just outdoors kind of shoes or gear as a status symbol, but it almost kind of felt that way in the UP. Um, and trying to get things that were, you know, I learned the hard way a number, but you know, you can't skimp on, um, on gear, especially in winter in the UP. Uh, so it was really expensive to just be able to make the most of that time. And, you know, I was able to borrow some things from friends and uh, fortunate enough to, to be able to participate, but that's a huge um, there's also the lack of representation. Nobody really looks like me. Uh, and that's something that I think a lot of people of color experience. Um, and there's also a lack of representation in someone's um, in inability to, uh, in their ability to, to perform certain um, outdoor activities. So you often see people kind of rappelling, you know, down a rock face and rock climbing or, you know, kayaking and you never see really the learning piece of that. Um, and that can be a whole other layer of vulnerability and really intimidating to try new things on top of all of these other pieces where you don't feel comfortable in the outdoors. So um, a big part of, you know, color out here and the work that I'm, I'm trying to do is to lean into that public learning space and that kind of um, the vulnerability of that so that people don't feel like they have to be experts just to try something out. Um, so yeah, that's sort of a as short as I could keep it <laughs> um, on some of the barriers that I think uh, that people of color face in inclusion. And I guess another, I would also add like representation as far as just even being preparedness. Um, I went on a 10 day backpacking trip last year and you know, I couldn't find anything to do, like any suggestions or articles here, like mine for 10 days without being able to like condition it and brush it and do all the things I need to do um, because not a lot of people who have hair like mine have been backpacking enough to start to kind of create that content or best practices, you know, or things like menstrual hygiene, um, just those areas of representation for people to have safe and um, enjoyable times in the outdoors uh, are, I think, also big pieces there. Yeah. Um, well, it's, it's complex for sure. And um, so, and you're absolutely right, we could spend hours and days uh, talk, talking about each and every one of those and, and unpacking them. Um, 
you know, I'd like to hear your thoughts a little bit on, you know, when you talk about um, representation and the importance of representation, um, you know, we, when you look at the statistics and, and everything, you know, you have said about why um, certain people use and don't use the outdoors, um, we need to also at the same time be very careful that we're not saying, you know, black people don't, you know, blank. Um, it's not that they don't hike or camp or, um, you know, climb mountains. Um, so how do you balance that making sure that we're, um, you know, fostering um, opportunities to get new people involved in, and really doing that education, um, but not making the assumptions that they're not already? Yeah. Um, well, you had asked, I think, a little earlier, and I don't know if I touched on it as much, so I can now, um, about what led me to kind of uh, include the folks that I did on the adventure of creating the, the pilot episode of Color Out Here. Um, and it was done intentionally to um, bring in, you know, Shay Mohan, who, uh, she's the uh, Grand Rapids, she runs the Grand Rapids chapter for Outdoor Afro, and um, I wanted to showcase people of color who have expertise in the outdoors in addition to people of color who are willing to do that public, go on that public learning journey. So, you know, Daryl and learning how to kayak for the first time um, or canoe for the first time. And, you know, David who had always had interest in it, but never really had anybody to kind of show him. So that kind of um, wanting to in have conversations both on and off camera um, to build real authentic community, not just for the show, um, that shows representation of people of color having expertise in these spaces and also um, shows people who are in that vulnerable spot of learning um, and, and have maybe have different, are kind of on a spectrum of their interest or enthusiasm. You know, Daryl kind of said he was doing me a favor to just kind of tag along. Um, and I think that, you know, David was, you know, he was really excited and he's, you know, he and I have since gone on hikes and stuff. And so um, I think that, yeah, just kind of showing that, um, that it's not a monolith, that there's uh, lots of people of color who are doing amazing, just badass things in the outdoors. Um, and that that, that, rep, that piece of representation, um, I think could definitely be in the forefront of just outdoor recreation in general, um, showcasing folks of different, um, different race, different body types, different gender, um, and that this is an experience that can be, uh, yeah, everybody can be good at. Um, so. Yeah, absolutely, and, and different abilities. I mean, that, you know, making sure that, um, you know, for the North Country Trail, all of the outdoors, but the North Country Trail um, specifically is, you know, our, our area of, of mission work, and it's a national scenic trail. It is public land that should be available to all and, and making sure that um, everybody is included and feels welcome um, and has the ability, you know, to participate in um, the work that we do to, to build and maintain it is um, incredibly important. So, you know, speak a little bit about, you know, how you, it's your mission also to get more people out, outside and how really do you approach that? You've got the show, but I know you're also doing you know, lots of other work to encourage others to get get outside and, you know, what's your, what's your big goal? Yeah, um, I guess, uh, you know, a, a few, a number of things are, are kind of in the works. Um, you know, obviously there's the, there's, there's two BCs that, you know, go with COVID. There's, I feel like, BC, like before COVID and then BC because COVID. <laughs> um, so I think, uh, because COVID, uh, we were, you know, hoping to maybe uh, be able to do a, a season of the show. And, you know, that's just been a challenge right now. And um, there's just other things to kind of uh, essential needs to kind of prioritize for folks. So we have done a series of other uh, media uh, projects. Um, there's kind of a mini podcast series that's uh, available. I think a couple of the episodes are available on Spotify now that um, just kind of calling people that I know leaders in, um, in working to create more inclusion in outdoor spaces and how they felt that COVID was uh, impacting that work either been, you know, for the better or making it more challenging. Um, so, you know, how can you 
how can the outdoors help with mental and physical health during these times and interviewing my friend who's a nurse to kind of unpack some of that and how can you get outside safely? Um, you know, how do you build community and feel safe? You know, talking to uh, some, some men that I know, black men and what they're doing to kind of go out in you know, with, with groups of other, of other friends and, and family and community to be able to, to get outside, especially you know, in those earlier months of COVID um, when we all really needed to be outside to do something. Um, but still that, that fear still is there. So, you know, and this is right after, um, just, yeah, all of the, after everything, uh, George Floyd and, and everything started to kind of come to light in the media, um, really trying to understand how all of these national and global situations are affecting this work. So those, um, those interviews are up on Spotify now. And then uh, a few weeks ago, I also did a, a virtual event um, with Brad Garman, who is the director of the Michigan Office of Outdoor Recreation, um, and uh, Lieutenant Governor Garmin, uh, Garland Gilchrist to just kind of talk about recreate responsibly and the intersection of safety and inclusion in the outdoors and what opportunities there are for both the business community and government, government the, and government to um, work separately and collaboratively in creating um, safety and inclusion for people of color. So those have been a few of the things that we have worked on and uh, we're looking to do, I think probably another part uh, part two of that kind of virtual platform to, to dig into that a little bit, especially as you know, hunting season is coming up and just helping people navigate, um, you know, going outside safely as I expect more people will be into the fall and um, understanding, yeah, what's going on outside and how we can continue to move the work forward. And also in a time where there's gonna be I think, a lot of political tension too, and just kind of be cognizant of all of the, the barriers and the opportunities to work um, across sectors to help facilitate solutions for change. Yeah. So what, if what has the outdoors meant to you during COVID? Um, you know, and how has how a, your personal um, recreation, you know, changed um, over the past six months? Yeah, I think um, I think it's helped me to expand how I define um, outdoor recreation uh, and to kind of incorporate. I, I mean, I, I would have considered a year ago, I would have considered bike ride in the park as outdoor recreation, but, you know, even just uh, seeing a lot of my neighbors were doing really cool chalk art in the neighborhood, um, or some of the murals that I've kind of taken for granted in the past in, in the neighborhood, just walking my dog, um, kind of thinking about new ways to experience the outdoors. I've been having meetings under my favorite tree at my favorite city park um, for the last few weeks. And uh, I think that COVID has kind of helped to um, evolve or expand our, our definition of outdoor recreation. It doesn't have to be something like more extreme. You know, you don't have to go white river rafting. You can go for, you know, you can buy some old rollerblades off eBay and go rollerblading in the park like I attempted to do a few weeks ago and that was an interesting adventure. Um, but yeah, I, I think that that's been a huge piece of it. And also just, yeah, really leaning into um, how we define place and not things that I had maybe taken for granted in my own backyard, even just plants um, or trees and kind of, you know, busting out my plant identifier on my phone um, and learning more about um, this place that I'm in that I constantly just don't eat, I overlook every day. So that's been kind of an interesting yeah, I think uh, that is something that I think so many people, you know, share in um, the fact that we have been looking right outside our door instead of thinking that adventure, you know, is is somewhere far away and somewhere that we have to go to. I can say in the early weeks of uh, quarantine, we were doing kind of vision boards with my family of where where do we want a vacation, you know, <laughs> when this is all over. Um, and we have some great ideas, but I think um, really... Um, recognizing, you know, what we have in front of us has been such um, a benefit of, you know, this horrible thing that we've gone gone through 
um, but we can really recognize the good things that we do have in front of us, which is a lot of trails and a lot of public lands everywhere. And like you said, even a, a tree out in your yard or in the park across the street is so meaningful. Um, so let's, you know, talk a little bit about, you know, what, what building a diverse and equitable um, and inclusive environment for outdoor recreation looks like. And, you know, I know we could talk for hours about that too, about the difference between what diversity and inclusion and um, equity mean, all very different terms, um, you know, but what um, speaks to you personally about where, you know, where you want to see um, outdoor recreation go and what it means to be equitable um, to you? Yeah, I think, um, I, I think it's, it kind of centers around a couple of pieces, um, creating access to uh, gear and also skills to know how to use necessary gear, um, how to safely and comfortably go outside if you want to go camping, um, just access to those skills. Um, I also think that uh, exploring opportunities to uh, for capacity building for community organizing and kind of having some, um, you know, folks who do have the skills, um, people of color to lead groups, not unlike, you know, uh, Latino outdoors or outdoor Afro and, and um, affinity spaces like that uh, to create community and, and build joy and um, forge new relationships with people of color to, um, to nature and outdoor place. Um, so I think that that's, those would be, um, I mean, those are very general and they're not, you know, very specific <laughs> strategies. I, I, I'm not, I don't want to lie and say that I have the answers in mind. Um, I think it's just kind of step by step trying to push further and further and trying to get change. Um, I think that conversations and working with, um, you know, the, the Lieutenant Governor's office and um, with the Michigan Office of Outdoor Recreation and kind of the DNR in uh, helping to educate, you know, folks in the DNR on just even awareness that people of color are maybe are going outside for sometimes the first time, um, don't necessarily understand all the expectations or of what uh, protocol to follow if they're in, if they're going for hikes and um, things like that. So being able to kind of advocate and empathize with um, new experiences and you know, just people of color sometimes being in, in rural areas um, can be challenging. And um, like I said, there's a lot of political tension happening right now. And um, I think so that that awareness would be the first step and then trying to build policy to um, hold it into place so that it's not all, um, it doesn't all rest on the shoulders of uh, folks who do just want to go and enjoy the outdoors um, to kind of forge their own paths there. And, you know, selfishly, that's where a lot of this came from is I was like, I just kind of want to go camping and <laughs> I want to be able to do it safely and I want to build community in the outdoors. Um, so what, you know, just trying to kind of figure out where I can push for change so that I can do that. And hopefully if I have some skills to do that, I can pass them, um, pass them on and, and help to kind of build folks who want to, a group of folks who want to come camping with me. That's ultimately really <laughs> kind of the goal. So, yeah. Who doesn't, everybody just wants people to go camping with, right? That's <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think, and I went on, I, I mentioned going on a backpacking trip last year um, with the National Outdoor Leadership School, Knowles, and it was their first ever course um, designed exclusively for people of color. And it was 10 of us in uh, the Gila National Forest um, in New Mexico. And it was something I had never done anything like that before. I was extremely nervous. I'm also an introvert and I was gonna be with nine people I had never met. And I was like, what if they're all extroverts? And then just be like the weirdo um, and so many things. And, you know, I was, I'm, was so impressed and inspired by how we were able to build this community in, um, you know, in just a 10 day period of time. And I also realized it's probably the first time if ever that I've been exclusively with people of color for that long a period of time. Um, and these are people that I, you know, still have close relationships with to this day, um, who still inspire me to this day. And so that really, I think, in kind of was another driver for wanting to create more opportunities 
for that. So it's not a class that I have to kind of sign up for and like go across the country for. It's something that I can kind of access here in Michigan because I do, I love Michigan and to explore it more, but I want to do it with people where I can be kind of authentic and, and true to what my experience and my relationship to the outdoors looks like. Yeah. We, well, in you know, you mentioned um, some great, affinity groups a moment ago, um, outdoor Afros and Latino outdoors and, uh, you know, they're unlikely hikers and all of these wonderful groups that are pulling together, um, you know, like-minded people, um, people that look alike, people that are, you know, um, have, um, that are similar in, in um, affinity groups. Um, you know, I wonder what your thoughts are on how those, you know, will intersect with all of the other organizations, um, you know, in the nation that are, are doing the work that are not diverse. And I will say, you know, our organization as one of them and, and how, you know, how we build towards um, merging that work and making sure that we all have space where we feel um, comfortable, but that we make sure that, you know, the broader community is being made, you know, more diverse at the same time. Yeah, I mean, I think I, you know, and I, I'm, Still not an expert. I'm still learning about um, a lot of a lot of this work, and you know, I I think that there's there's a lot of opportunities. But I more I guess more generally, what I've um, suggested to some folks who you know as allies are looking to support um, support the growth and evolution of this work and creating an outdoors that is for everyone um, would be to really listen to you know the communities that you're hoping to support um, instead of trying to kind of go and create new solutions. Um, really, you know, what does, what would Outdoor Afro need? What resources would they need? And kind of looking at um, strategies or uh, solutions that have been designed by people of color for people of color um, and just kind of elevating um, and investing in those however, you know, however you can, whether that's, you know, financial have intellectual or social capital to, to share. Um, yeah, just kind of putting those uh, in the spotlight and just elevating um, things that have already been created as opposed to trying to put resources into creating new solutions that aren't necessarily um, be designed by um, people of color. Yeah, thank you. We had a, um, a session a couple days ago with our, we have a next gen, um, next generation coalition that are um, 18 to 35 year olds. Um, and we had a panel of them and had this great discussion. And, you know, one of the questions we posed them was, you know, what do we need to do as an association? And they said, listen and be open to change um, and making sure that we're, you know, available to all of the ideas and the things that are already out there. Um, you know, what do you tell, what do you tell young people? I think, you know, it, especially when you talk about the um, transgenerational um, uh, you know, knowledge that has been passed down and, you know, how much of the message when you talk to people about the outdoors kind of shifts depending on age. Um, you know, is it the same message or is it, you know, when you're speaking to, you know, a 60 year old trying to get them in the outdoors, is that very different than if it's, you know, a 10 year old? Yeah, I guess, um, I mean, there's always, you always kind of have to target your audience uh, regardless of age. So, but I think ultimately the message is still the same. Um, it's something about, I, I, I think a lot about place. Um, Rebecca Salnet is a big influence uh, for me and in, in how she, uh, especially in her book, um, The Encyclopedia of Trouble and Spaciousness. And, and she just talks about how place is an intersection of you know, history of ecology, of community, of, you know, what biodiversity is there, all of these different layers and trying to look at place through that lens. So, you know, you might go to a park and maybe there's a bench that's named in somebody's honor or something like that. And that is a piece of it. But thinking about what does this place mean to me? What does this place mean to the people whose, you know, ancestral land that we're on? Um, how are how do we use these different lenses um, of place to uh, forge our own relationships to them that aren't kind of uh, founded in sort of, you know, in, in white supremacy, essentially. Um, 
and yeah, create our own narrative and relationship to that. So whether, you know, thinking about tools that um, can help to, to uh, capture the development of that relationship as well, if that's journaling or poetry, or, you know, maybe learning how to take pictures with your phone or with a camera um, in the outdoors, just how do you kind of document and capture that sort of journey of, of creating your own relationship. Um, so I think that that's been um, kind of a, a bigger piece there is, is um, helping to, you know, there's, there's the stigma that's, that's real and, and valid that people of color have around kind of outdoorsy stuff. Um, when, and, and I think that there's ways to kind of, how do we kind of build in new narratives so that that stigma might still kind of exist not taking up all of the space in the room when they they think of outdoors and slowly hopefully other narratives will start to kind of be the, at the forefront there will you talk a little bit about um idle wilds and i know i still want people to watch your show and want to learn about your experience there um but you know if you can tell us a little bit about what idle wild is and and you know the history yeah, um, Idlewild is uh, Idlewild is dope. Uh, it is about an hour north of Grand Rapids, where I live, um, right outside of a town called Baldwin, and it has an incredible history. Um, I think also an incredible future uh, ahead of it as well. Um, it is a town that was um, a community that was built by Black people, African Americans for Black people. Um, during a time kind of earlier on in the 20th century when um, black people started to kind of develop more wealth um, and so successful black folks from the Detroit and Chicago areas were looking at you know, wanting to have their own kind of vacation spots and places to enjoy outdoors and um, ended up kind of getting a, a plot of land up there and building community in it. And it ended up becoming this huge, um, a just hub of uh, amazing talent that would pass through there. Just so many incredible, you know, singers and and actors and actresses and um, uh, black people coming in and, and kind of celebrating that community and that sense of safety. And I think uh, and and enjoying you know the outdoors, enjoying being able to have beaches. Um, there's a lot of segregation and a lot of history of segregation around beaches in our country and just. Uh, much by us for us kind of um, kind of thing and, and it's there it's since gone through some real economic decline um, but a lot of when we connected with them in the, creating the show we did a, a ser quite a few town halls because you know there have been other you know documentaries and other kind of films that have come in and um, done things about Idlewild and we wanted to make sure that that this platform was elevating the story that they wanted told. Um, and they were, they're so, they're su the community is super proud of their, um, their, their history, but they're also, they didn't want that to be the only piece of their narrative. They also wanted to emphasize that they're doing a lot around kind of economic development in that community, working together to revitalize it and bring people back. And it's, it's very inclusive. It's certainly, um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't say that it's if you're not black, you can't you feel welcome and and have a good time there. Um, I think it's just it's a uh, it's just a really beautiful space. The way that they have for generations, these families have been kind of stewarding this community, and um, it's yeah, it's really it's really beautiful. And you know, unfortunately, COVID kind of came in and, and crushed lots of lots of fun things that we all had planned to do this year, but. Um, you know, I know that they had planned, they have film festivals, they, do, you know, all sorts of really cool outdoor things during the summer. It's a really beautiful place to go. And I think I'm really looking forward to kind of see, uh, seeing where they go and how it can potentially be um, a place for people of color to, to safely start to build their own relationships to the outdoors. Yeah, that's it. And it's, uh such a shame to see what um, COVID has done to tourism and to communities. Um, hopefully we will be back soon. Um, 
you know, I've heard you describe uh, the North Country Trail as being near and dear to your heart <laughs> on your social media. So tell us a little bit about your, you know, your relationship with the North Country Trail and, and what experiences you've had. Yeah, I mean, I think some of my experience has been down here um, over kind of by White Cloud. I know that you can hop on the trail there and there's a, um, I'm spacing on the name of it right now, but it's the, I believe it's the only wildflower sanctuary um, in the national park system over there. So um, that's a really cool spot to go. And I've been there. Not Lake, a, I think. What is it? Loda Lake. Yes. It's yeah. In the forest. Yeah. Um, so we, we, I've been there um, a number of times and, uh, but I think a lot of my initial experience with the trail was when I was living in in Marquette and um, trail was really just kind of right in our backyards. Um, literally actually cut through a friend of mine's their apartment's backyard when we were in college. So, um, and I think it was the first time I had kind of realized there were trails that stretched that long. Um, and it was always amazing to me to feel like I was just standing on this trail and there could be people standing on the same, you know, hundreds of miles. Um, so I, yeah, I, that was where I spent a lot of time kind of along Lake Superior um, and just exploring my own yeah, my own relationship to being in the outdoors and just kind of hiking and um, yeah, really kind of falling in love with the UP. And I feel like the North Country Trail is always sort of the, the center piece of that, uh, that scene in my mind when I kind of remember back to just ex experiencing the magic of the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. A lot of it took place alongside or on the North Country Trail, so yeah. I think the magic of the UP is a saying that I hear. <laughs> I hear a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is a magical place, definitely. <laughs> uh, it was probably the most pristine place I had ever seen coming from Brooklyn. So, um, yeah, it's a good place in my heart for sure. Do you get up there often? I haven't for uh, a uh, probably two years now, but um, I was hoping to go this year. Um, so hopefully. It's still possible I can swing it this fall, but uh, other than I, otherwise, um, if, I mean, I don't mind going in the winter, but if not, I definitely would like to get up there next summer. Um, it's, yeah, it's a wonderful, it's, it's a, it, it definitely seems like another world away, um, but yeah, it's a great place to be. So, you know, working, um, working to bring more um, inclusion and diversity and, and equity to the outdoors is so critical. Um, you know, what's at risk if we're not successful? You know, what happens um, both culturally and environmentally if we're not able to, um, you know, bring everybody to the outdoors? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, I think from an environmentalist perspective, um, so in my my day job, I uh, work in economic development and working to build, um, help companies be more socially and environmentally sustainable in their business practices. And uh, I think that there's, I guess, in, in, I, I would go to all these kind of environmental advocacy and conservationist, you know, conferences and meetings and whatever. And you know, they were already white, and environmental conservation has been majority white for you know. For a while now and uh, I think we, you know if, if environmentalism is led predominantly by white people but um, the demographics of our country are changing to where you know people of color are going to be the majority in, in the country then that's problematic for uh, you know the sustainability of, an, of the environmental movement um, as a whole I think and then of course there's environmental justice pieces that are you know immediate and long-term um, require action and uh, people to have access to the, you know, the knowledge of, uh, of environmental, of how their environment affects them, their health, um, you know, people of color, black people um, are, you know, particularly susceptible to um, environmental injustices and uh, helping people to kind of understand understand the, the, those issues um, and creating those spaces for people to access that in, that information. Um, and then, 
yeah, working to kind of so that fo folks can have their the capacity to again create their own solutions to protecting themselves, protecting their communities, protecting their you know the future generations um, of our planet and being good ancestors. Uh, I think that all of those things uh, would be at risk if we're not intentional in um, creating more pathways to for inclusion for people to build more positive relationships in, in the outdoors through outdoor recreation, for example, um, and to have long-term positive relationships to, to steward envir the environment moving forward from there. Um, yeah, so I think that would probably be some yeah. of there are huge, huge implications and consequences um, if we don't do it and if we don't do it right. And I, I learned years ago in my first recreation job about 15 years ago um, with an advocacy organization that one of my coworkers in training me said, um, you know, even though we do, we do trail work here, it's really environmental work because trails are the avenue for people to explore public lands and to learn about the environment and to care. Um, about what the earth has to offer. So it's, uh, it's important, important work. Yeah, and I think also, you know, for an, an economic development lens too, within the outdoor recreation industry, um, you know, it's a growing market, it's a growing consumer base and demand and um, having people of color see themselves in the outdoor recreation industry and, and being a bigger part of that industry to help inform ways that businesses can advocate for inclusivity and change um, is really important as well. So it, it, yeah, it comes down to just getting more representation so that um, there are more folks at the table, um, people of color at the table who are kind of helping to guide this work moving forward. Yeah, it's important to have the leadership um, there um, you know, the, so everybody is a part of actually making the change and making decisions to lead what happens. Well, we have, um, I think only about six minutes left now. This hour has flown by and I have a couple questions. So before we wrap up, we will, um, take some questions from, uh, from our viewers. Um, who is inspiring you right now? Um, and anybody that we should know about and who should we be, you know, following on social media or reading? Yeah, um, I mean, I think that you had mentioned a number of them, like uh, Unlikely Hikers is great, um, you know, Akuna Hikes, um, Outdoor Afro, there's a huge community of people uh, on Instagram, and that, admittedly, I was kind of skeptical when in Shaping Narratives, they trained us to learn, use Instagram as a space for community building, so it's like, it's social media, but it developed a lot of really Really great relationships that have been so supportive um, and inspiring in doing this work and kind of helping me to even just change my own internalized framework that I'm working to unpack. So I think, um, you know, kind of looking, starting with some of those groups or like Melanin Base Camp, places that, um, you know, handles that show both the, the learning journey for people of color in outdoor spaces as well as people of color as experts outdoors um intersectional environmentalism environmentalism is really great as well um who are just kind of reframing that narrative uh like i mentioned before rebecca salnett's book the encyclopedia of trouble and spaciousness is a really great book on kind of changing the lens of how we see place and um, build relationships to place it's just as a really cool atlas series that she does that are these beautiful kind of tolkien-esque maps that um show different cities and different ways of looking at those cities, whether it be, you know, monarch butterfly migration patterns or the, you know, the emergence of the LGBT activism movement in San Francisco and how those different things intersect in one place. And um, I think that that was, yeah, that's been some of the things that I've been kind of reading. Recently. So, um, yeah. Also reading Sweetgrass has been, I just finished that finally. What was it? Sweetgrass? Braiding Sweetgrass. Um, it's written by a, uh, a botanist, uh, Potawatomi botanist, and kind of tying together um, her, her culture and, and her traditions of understanding um, plants and nature and how it kind of ways that it brushes up against or, um, co or kind of runs parallel to 
more kind of white scientific approaches to um, botany and how she works to kind of braid those together. So it's a really great book that um, I think has helped me to frame out shifting away from humans and nature to humans are nature um, and what that means. Nice. Well, we will put, I'll try to um, make sure that I put links to um, the folks that you have mentioned and um, the different groups that we've tried to highlight before. We'll make sure we put that under um, the recording for this. Um, somebody wants to know what outdoor skill are you studying right now or, or what is something that you'd like to learn? Hmm. Um, I would really love to go on another backpacking trip like the one I went on last year uh i'd like to and i'd like to get better at cooking in the outdoors um i never thought that there was much skill to it and then i saw some of my instructors like kind of hogging all of the really dope recipes that they had learned and like baking right, like cinnamon rolls and i didn't know you could do that so i would like to learn how to um, do some of that a little bit better um, yeah, I think, and uh, I'd like to, I've been rock climbing once and I'd like to get more comfortable with that as well. Nice. Yeah, yeah outdoor cooking is a tough, um, a tough skill, <laughs> but if, if you do well, sometimes it can really make the, uh, make the difference between, you know, a cold granola bar trip and a, something that's, <laughs> that's really enjoyable. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a valuable, it's a valuable tool. Uh, I know towards the end of our trip last year, starting to kind of barter between folks who had different rations. So, you know, like, can you help me pack this up? And like, I will trade you my help for a piece of that summer sausage that you don't, I know you have hidden away. Anyway. So those types of things, um, <laughs> so it can be helpful. Awesome. Well, Alice, it is eight o'clock and it is way too short. This has flown by. Um, entirely way too fast and I hope that next time um, we meet we will be actually on the trail and can go for a hike instead and maybe take a video and, and share that with, uh, with everybody but thank you so much for joining us tonight. I really appreciate it and thanks for everybody who came. Take care. Yes and thank you everybody that um, tuned in. Um, go to nctacelebration.org. That's where you will find um, the recording of, um, of tonight's conversation with Alice. We will also link to Color Out Here. Um, we will also link to, I'll try to include some of those links and other of those references um, that um, we talked about. And I know one of our other questions was, um, where can we follow Alice? So we will make sure that we have your social media um, Alice Lynn narrative, I think. Alice is Lynn's narrative, I put it in the chat. So um, I think I actually put it privately, so I may not do that, but before I log off here, but uh, yeah, feel free, to, feel free to check it out and reach out if you have any questions as well, so. Awesome, well thank you, and thank you all for joining us. This closes out our month of celebration. Um, we still have one more, epi one more, um, uh, celebration um, event coming up in evening with the National Park Service on September 15th at 7 p.m. So look to our website to sign up for that one. Um, but this is wrapping up all of our August events. So thank you, Alice. And um, we were so glad to have you tonight. And um, thank you all for tuning in. We'll see you later. Good night. Bye.